So what you just saw is the beginning of the epic battle between the American cockroach and my favorite insect, the emerald jewel wasp, which is a parasitoid and uses the American cockroach as a host for its developing young. So hey everyone, my name is Ken Catania, and this movie is a companion to my recent book on the art and craft of doing science. And I should start by telling you, I actually brought the jewel wasps and the cockroaches to my lab because I teach about this system on Halloween. And I wanted to better document the interactions, get some good photography, get some video of the behavior back and forth. And one of the lessons that I've learned repeatedly when doing this kind of thing is it doesn't necessarily matter why you're taking a closer look at a system. Once you really focus in on something, once you really start paying attention to a particular biological system, you'll start to usually think of puzzles to solve or you may make discoveries about something that you didn't expect. And that certainly happened in this case. I'm going to tell you about that. But first, I want to just kick things off by telling you about the basic biology of this system. So the emerald jewel wasp is a parasitoid and it will subdue a American cockroach by first stinging it between the front legs and that's referred to as sting one. And once the front legs are actually temporarily paralyzed, it then follows up with another sting, sting two, directly into the cockroach brain. And this is said to essentially zombify the cockroach because the cockroach will then become compliant. It can still walk, fly, run if you give it the right stimuli, but it will not try to escape from the wasp, which will then take it to a hole and barricade it in that hole lay an egg on it, and then, well, things go downhill from there. So I'm going to show you this whole sequence of behaviors, but because people have sort of described the cockroach as losing its free will after it's stung in the brain, I built a special diorama as a tongue-in-cheek way to do a behavior test on free will. There's basically one place you might imagine the cockroach would want to stay, and another place where it definitely wouldn't want to go. So I'll let you watch this and then I'll come back to some of the biology of the system. All right, I hope you enjoyed that sort of whimsical view of the wasp behavior. And I have been asked if I trained the wasp to do that. And of course I did not. I depended on the wasp's instinctual behavior to find a hole and I left only one hole in the arena and that was in the skull. And then the wasp will then barricade that hole and I left only the treasure chest with that material for the wasp to use. So that's what it used to barricade the hole. 
But now I want to sort of leave off this sort of fun Halloween video and return to the biology of the system. And remember I sort of said that most of these biological systems have sort of links and connections to previous research or other aspects of biology. And that was certainly the case for the jewel wasp and the cockroach. So if you look at the images below, this sort of shows the standoff between the wasp and the cockroach. And what the cockroach is doing is arraying its spiny legs out in front of it so that the wasp has to sort of go past those. And, it, and the cockroach can use those as a defense from the wasp's attack. And it's not only because the spines are defensive, they are also very importantly sensory in function. They are very sensitive mechanoreceptive organs that respond to touch. In fact, there are a number of labs. I've taught the lab that uses the cockroach leg as sort of a model system for demonstrating to students action potentials because it's very simple and easy to do. In fact, there's a company uh, called Backyard Brains, and I'll leave a link in the description below because they make some great, really affordable material where you know high school students or even people at home can easily record these neuronal signals from the response of the spines as they are being deflected. So I was able to actually set that up in about five minutes. And so what I'm going to do is show you what this is like so you can listen in to the sound of these neuronal signals, these action potentials, and hear what they sound like. So that buzzing sound, those were the action potentials. Those were volleys of neuronal signals, the all or nothing spike or action potential that is the foundation of how almost all neurons communicate information, including how we, with our own brains, with 86 billion neurons, send information to the different cells that is basically the, the underpinnings of consciousness, what we perceive, how we move, and so forth. And that's kind of profound to think about really, that we share this sort of basic feature with an animal as simple as a cockroach. But there's more to the story. And so one of the goals in science is not just to say, oh, that's really cool and profound, but to start to fill into some of the blanks that are there in the system. And one of the missing pieces of the puzzle is, what do those signals coming from the spines on the leg of a cockroach mean to the cockroach? And as it turns out, the answer to part of that puzzle, at least one of the things that they mean, is revealed by the interaction between the emerald jewel wasp and the cockroach. And so I want you to watch the next videos as the wasp accidentally, gently stimulates those spines. And it's a pretty dramatic response in the cockroach. All right, so clearly one of the things that those spines on the cockroach leg do is provide an early warning system of sorts, allowing the cockroach to defend itself from potential predators. And that defense can be life-saving. If the cockroach kicks the wasp multiple times in the head, the wasp will break off the attack and look for an easier victim. So next I want to dig down further into the biology of what's going on here. And for that I want to return to the, the point where the wasp is barricading the cockroach into the hole. So this, of course, is the skull in the Halloween video. This would normally be a hole that the wasp found somewhere in the environment. And not many people have looked at what happens in that dark chamber when the wasp is laying an egg on the cockroach. And so that's what I want to talk to you about next. So I'm going to show you a video of what goes on there. It turns out that the wasp lays an egg in a very precise position on the cockroach, just one egg. And this is on the second leg, either on the left side or the right side of the cockroach. And you can see that in this video where the wasp is basically sort of probing that leg of the cockroach and eventually deposits the egg there, sort of glues it to what you might call the thigh of the cockroach. And one of the questions is, how does the wasp 
feel the right location. It's obviously doing this in darkness. And one of the potential candidates for that turns out to be a bunch of little hairs at the tip of the abdomen of the wasp that, that, that are being rubbed against the cockroaches. It sort of probes for where should I lay the egg? How do I find that perfect spot? So the obvious experiment to sort of address the question about whether those hairs are in fact the sensors that the, the wasp is using in order to find the right location is to trim those off. And so in this next image, you'll see the result of having trimmed those hairs very carefully off of the abdomen of the wasp. And the result of that turns out to be very interesting because in fact, the wasp then lays the egg in all kinds of unusual places. And those eggs, when the larva hatches to try to prey on the cockroach, those larvae always die. So it turns out that those are in fact key sensors for the wasp, a little bit like the spines on the cockroach legs being key sensors as well. And those are very important for the mother wasp to put the egg in the right place. And so this is sort of an example of filling in puzzle pieces in the biology of this system. First by discovering, okay, gentle stimulation of the cockroach spines results in a specific, very adaptive behavior. The use of these little sensory hairs, what would be called sensilla, on the abdomen of the wasp is how the wasp figures out what's the right anatomical location for laying the egg. But the story, like usual, only gets more interesting from there. Remember how I mentioned that working on a scientific puzzle is often a gateway for discovering the unexpected because it focuses your attention on a specific part of the system under study. And that happened in this case. So it probably won't surprise you to know that not many people have looked at the underside of a cockroach while an emerald jewel wasp is laying the egg on the leg. But that's what I had to do in order to look at the effect of trimming off those sensory sensilla, those little sensory hairs, on the abdomen of the wasp. So let me show you where I was focused and what I started to see. So if you look at the image below, you can see the underside of the cockroach and the abdomen of the wasp. And you'll also notice that the middle leg of the cockroach is covering the area where the wasp usually lays the egg. So these are some interesting things to notice. Now what I also noticed was that the wasp is sort of fiddling around at the center of the cockroach there for no apparent reason that anyone's ever described before. And when I looked more closely, what I discovered is the wasp is actually stinging the cockroach. And it's stinging the cockroach right in the location of the control center for the middle legs. This is called the second thoracic ganglion. And because the cockroach has already been sort of pre-anesthetized by the wasp when the wasp stung the cockroach in the brain, I could do a little minor dissection and remove a piece of the cuticle covering that part of the cockroach nervous system to see is the wasp in fact stinging into the central nervous system part of the control center for the legs. And what you can see in the movie below is yes, that's exactly what is happening. The cockroach is getting stung in the control center for the legs there. And shortly after the wasp deposits venom in that control center, the leg moves out of the way so that the wasp can accurately lay its egg in just the right place for the larva to hatch and survive. So now I want to put that finding in context because it reveals something that's pretty impressive about the emerald jewel wasp. So if you look at the drawing below, this is the underside of a cockroach, and next to that I'm going to put the front end of the central nervous system. Now, you've already heard about sting one, and that sting is made directly into the first thoracic ganglion, temporary, temporarily paralyzing the front legs and allowing the wasp to then very precisely sting in the brain for sting two. And that pacifies or zombifies the cockroach, allowing the wasp to then bring it to the hole where it's gonna barricade it. What we now know is that while the cockroach and the wasp are in that hole, the wasp then delivers additional stings. I only showed you one of them, but there are actually three successive stings, this time into the second thoracic ganglion, and that's what causes the leg to extend, allowing the wasp to very precisely lay the egg in just the right spot. Now, that's 
really amazing because most wasps don't sting into the central nervous system. But not only that, the emerald jewel wasp is stinging into the cockroach central nervous system into these small precise locations, delivering the appropriate venom to cause three different kinds of reactions in the cockroach in just the right consecutive sequence to sort of bend the cockroach to its will. It's almost like sort of a neurosurgical strike here that's going on. And that allows the emerald jewel wasp to reproduce. So it's a real testament to how evolution has honed the behavior of the wasp to really perfectly take advantage of its only host, the American cockroach. So um, there's not only the sort of lesson of the impressive biology that's going on here, but there's also sort of more general lessons about the way science often unfolds. So for example, there's a lot of connecting the dots that you can do. For example, finding out that one of the functions of the spines on the cockroach legs is to provide that early warning system allowing the cockroach to defend itself. But then also there's what goes on when you try to solve even a simple puzzle in science. For example, what are those little hairs, those sensilla on the abdomen for? That caused me to focus on a particular area during a particular time during the wasp's behavior. And only because of that focus did I then discover that there was this other series of stings that had been overlooked since the 1940s when people first started, started studying the emerald jewel wasp behavior. So I hope you enjoyed this video. And in the next video, I'll describe some more ways that discoveries sometimes unfold. And until then, I'll leave you with an image of the emerald jewel wasp.